Render to the maid here sent by God, the King of Heaven, the key of all the good towns which you have taken and violated in France. She is here come by God's will to reclaim the blood royal. She is very ready to make peace. If you will acknowledge her to be right, provided that France you render and pay for having held it. King of England, if you do not so, I am chief of war, and in whatever place I attain your people in France, I will make them quit it willy-nilly. If they will not obey, I will have them all slain. I am here sent by God, the King of Heaven, body for body, to drive you out of all France. That's a letter Joan of Arc dictated to the English, and it was sent over to their camp, sometimes by having an archer shoot her letters across the battle lines. She wrote a lot of letters to the English during her time in the French army, most of which were mocked and laughed at. In late April, she went to the bridge that was at the heart of the English siege of Orléans, the bridge where they had cut Orléans off from the town's allies, and she shouted at the English to surrender and save their own lives. But the English, led by Classidas, uh, Glassdale to the English, mocked her and called her cowgirl, and the men with her pimps, and told her they would burn her if they ever got a hold of her. A week later, as the French broke the siege and drove the English off the bridge, Joan shouted, Classidas, Classidas, yield thee to the king of heaven. Thou hast called me whore. I take great pity on thy soul and thy peoples. At that moment, Classidas, in full armor, fell into the water and was drowned. And right then and there, Joan wept for him and all the souls who drowned along with him. Imagine for a second that you'd never heard the story of Joan of Arc before. A teenage peasant girl in medieval France leaves her country home, goes to the court of the Prince of France, soon to be king, and convinces him to make her an army captain. Then, with no military experience or training, plays an instrumental role in breaking a months-long siege that turns the tide of war. It's so fantastic you think it was a legend or a fairy tale, but Joan was a major celebrity at the time, and her trial of condemnation after she was captured by the English and sub subsequent posthumous trial of rehabilitation by the French when they'd driven the English out of France provide us with a detailed account, both of Joan's own words in the first case and those of the people who knew her in the second. It's really unusual to have first-hand accounts of what people said and thought in this period in time. So how did she do it? According to Joan, she was guided by angels, specifically the archangel Michael and Saints Catherine and Margaret. She called them her voices, and they demonstrated remarkable foresight and knowledge through her. They transformed her from Jeannette, the peasant girl from Domremy, to Joan the Maid, hero of France. Was Joan divinely inspired? And if she was, how does her story fit into the larger picture of girls and women wielding supernatural power to stage rebellions? Joan was a good Catholic girl. But she also operated far outside the limits of her gender, life experience, and social class to turn the tide of a war that lasted a hundred years, performing miracles all along the way. My name's Rob Thompson. I am the supreme hierophant of the secret order of alchemical actors. I am with my grandmaster, Olivia Litterall. Hey. And our discussants today are going to be Savannah Verrett. Hello. <laughs> yes, it's a podcast, Savannah. Okay, hi. Uh, uh, Jacob Wheatley, too far from the mic. Come on down, man. Hi. Riley almost Riley. fell off the stage. And Riley Claxton, our resident Catholic, you'll remember from earlier mm -hmm. episodes. Uh, welcome, Riley. Uh, this is a cult confessions. We, we the, the members, members of the secret order of alchemical actors, do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling of the history of the occult as far as we know it. Joan's victory at Orléans took place on May 8, 1429. One and a half years later, she was in the hands of her enemies on trial for heresy, and on May 30th, 1431, she was burned at the stake. It's difficult to understand Joan's rise and fall without getting a feel for the war she figured in. So, Olivia, I, I know this is a little bit early. Yeah. But I think we need to start with a brief history. A very brief history of the Hundred Years' War. In 1066, William, Duke of Normandy, which is in France, became King of England and so began several hundred years of English lords owning and controlling French estates. In 1337, Philip VI of France had had enough, and, and, and he invaded Guinea. The Gu Guyenne. Guyenne. I was yeah, about to Guinea's say that's a whole like other Guinea. place. Guyenne. Where is Guyenne? Yeah, Guyenne is France. Go ahead. Oh. Well, he invaded Guyenne. 
The English called on the Flemish and the Germans to assist them, and the French called on the Scots, who also liked to fight for fight the English because they were regularly bugging the Scots. Edward III, King of England, claimed ownership of the French throne through his mother. He was the only grandson of Philip VI, but the French weren't having it. They said France was too important to be inherited through a woman, and medieval warfare ensued. Oh, I have been shot. Those damn English longbows, they aren't man enough to let us get close enough to bash their brains in. <coughs> I'm dying. I hate the British. They are so horrible, Pierre. I hate them so much. I know you do, Michael. I always remember those long nights we spent together with our brothers at arms around ah. the campfire, hating the British. Tell my wife. The British are the worst. Ha <laughs> ha! That was a French Arnold Schwarzenegger and Cookie Monster <laughs> fighting in the Hundred Years' War. <laughs> Olivia? Well, I don't know how to top that, but, um... French mounted knights were pretty easily dispatched by longbows, as well as knife men and pike men who just stabbed their horses. Then along came Charles V, or Charles the Wise. Since the French could not beat the English on the battlefield, he had a brilliant idea. I want you to stop fighting the British, but win the war anyhow. How wise. The French conducted raids and assaulted supply routes, and by 1380 gained back much of their lost territory, pushing the British all the way to the coast. But the King Charles VI was intermittently insane, and English King Henry V was super great at being a king, so advantage shifted back to the English. Let's hear a bit from Henry via Shakespeare. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile. After his victory at the Battle of Agincourt, Henry married the French king's daughter, Catherine, and became regent over his new half-insane father-in-law, Charles VI. His plan was to create a plan of royal succession under his line of English Henry Henry's. Well, Henry's, yeah, because we had Henry I in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th. No more Henry's. Rather than his father-in-law's line of French Charles's. That is very hard to say. 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, go on. Didn't make to the eighth on that one? I uh, can't remember. Go ahead. But the French kept up a steady resistance to the powerful Henry. On his third expedition to France, Henry contracted dysentery, which significantly weakened him. As it does. In May, he knew his health was failing. He made plans for his son's education and the government of England in France, and then he died. He was 35 years old. Young man. With Henry's death, things took a turn for the worse on the English side of things. The English Parliament decided that instead of paying for the war, they would just tax the French after they conquered their land and pretty much stopped funding the English occupation. They gambled that the siege of Orleans? You're Orleans. Orleans. Fancy. Would bring the French to heel and end the war once and for all. Which brings us up to Joan's career. And that's a brief history of the Hundred Years' War. Yeah, that went pretty well. Thanks. Joan, then known as Jeanette, was born in Dom Remy around 1412. She was a good, chaste farm girl who had one offer of marriage that she rejected because of a promise to her voices to maintain her virginity. That's my excuse. She was 13 when the voices first came to her a uh, time of life that we'll hear again in reference to the development of supernatural senses in our historical tour of Lady Magic. Joan's voices told her she should go to Robert de Baudricourt, captain of the king's army in the fortress of Vaucalor. Baudricourt sent her away twice, but Joan managed to persuade the people of the town and some of the men of the army, particularly a 57-year-old squire to the king, Jean de Metz, that she was the real deal. They got her some men's clothes to wear and a horse, and Baudricourt agreed to send her, but only if she would let him exorcise her first. Not by sprinting or anything, but, you know, your good old-fashioned... Exorcise. Yeah, not pea exert. soup spewing 360-degree head spin exorcism. He had to do it to her? Well, he wasn't going to do it himself. He was just an army guy. Ooh. He was going to get some priests to handle it. Get a yeah. professional. Uh, <laughs> so the priest said uh, that if there was any bad thing in Joan, she's, he's standing in front of her now, she should leave him. Uh, but if she were all good, that she should approach the priest. And she approached the priest and reminded him that she had just confessed her sins to him, uh, and it was sort of mean for him to <laughs> talk to her like that. <laughs> so they set off on a fairly treacherous journey to see the king at Chinon, under constant threat of being 
ambushed by the Burgundian and the English soldiers. So they're sort of wandering through enemy territory, trying to reach the French king, well, French prince at this point, uh, which they call a dauphin. Not to be confused mm. with the marine mammal. Uh, the Burgundians from Burgundy were French, but they'd allied themselves with the English, and they would play a big role in the end of Joan's story. We hear this from one of the men who accompanied her. His name was Bertrand uh, de Pouligny. Every night she lay down with Jean de Metz and me, keeping upon her surcoat and hose, tied and tight. I was young then, and yet I had neither desire nor a carnal movement to touch women, and would not have dared to do such a thing to Joan, because of the abundance of goodness I saw in her. Joan slept with the soldiers, but they all reported feeling no carnal lust for her. This wasn't because Joan was unattractive. She was probably a reasonably attractive girl. One of her close companions, the Duke d'Alençon, said, Sometimes in the army, I lay down to sleep with Joan and the soldiers, all in the straw together, and sometimes I saw Joan prepare for the night, and sometimes I looked at her breasts, which were beautiful, and yet I never had carnal desire for her. She scolded the soldiers for swearing. She drove away camp followers a.k.a. prostitutes, unless the soldiers were willing to marry them. That's a buzzkill. Uh, when soldiers were talking about sex, they would quickly clam up whenever Joan came near them. There's a legend that the king-to-be Charles VII made her guess who he was when she finally arrived at the French court, uh, which she managed without any problem. But Charles uh, wouldn't have needed this miraculous feat to impress him. She traveled 11 days through dangerous enemy territory and survived. She was convinced that he was destined to become the rightful king of France, which was enough to impress anyone who wanted to be the king of France. Uh, especially when you had a powerful rival in England. There was also a legend going around that a virgin maid would save France, which put the wind at her back, so to speak. The historical record indicates that in private, she gave Charles a secret sign that convinced him she was for real. But neither Joan nor Charles ever said what that sign was. Any guesses? Well, there's a theory that she had some kind of insight into the legitimacy of his birth um, that she would not have known, but she revealed to him. And that nobody else would have known but him. Mm -hmm. What'd she know? That he was illegitimate. Oh. Yeah. Right. And he was born with a tail. Yep. That he was not human. <laughs> sure. Sure. Reptilian? Reptilian? Oh no, he was, not a, he was not a reptilian. Savannah said it, not I didn't me. mean to go there. <laughs> Charles had her questioned by a faculty of theologians at Poitiers, and they determined that she was, at the very least, not under the influence of the devil and couldn't really do anybody any harm. Not a raging endorsement, but... I mean, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good recommendation. <laughs> I was questioned for three weeks by the clergy of the towns of Chinot and Poitiers, and the clerics of my party were of this opinion that it seemed to them that in my matter was nothing but good. It's important to take a moment to just acknowledge how many clergy members investigated and signed off on Joan before she made it to Orléans. She was already wearing men's clothes, riding a horse, and she was talking at length about her voices. I just want to call attention to these aspects of the story, thinking forward to her later condemnation. All right, so point made. Then Joan uh, leveled up like a character in a medieval video game. First, the king gave her the armor and status of a captain, but no official responsibilities except to continue on to assist at Orléans. That sounds super sweet. <laughs> like you have everything but the responsibility. You get the sweet <laughs> outfit, but yeah, none of the work. That's all I want. And the title, I guess, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, I'm an army captain, but I don't have to die. Hell yeah. Then she got a sword. <laughs> Uh, which was almost uh, as King Arthur Excalibur as any sword can be, albeit a bit more homely. She uh, was discovered, as she said it would be, buried behind the altar at the church of St. Catherine at Fairbois. So she probably passed through Fairbois on the way, and there was kind of a habit of burying swords behind altars, but, you know, pretty cool. The sword was in the earth, all rusty. And there were upon it five crosses, and I knew it by my voices. After the sword had been found, the prelates of the place had it rubbed, and at once the rust fell from it without difficulty. Then there was her standard, the last piece of her equipment. It was white and pictured a globe bordered with two angels on a field of fleur-de-lis, the sort of French three-leafed symbol. Joan said she liked her standard better than her sword. The vision for the design had come, like the location of the sword through her voices. The standard was wildly important to Joan's role on the battlefield, which was perhaps most significantly about rallying the soldiers' spirits. Which is not to say that Joan lacked for military knowledge. The bailiff of Chartres, Thibault d'Armagnac, said, Apart from the matter of war, she was simple and ignorant. But 
in the conduct and disposition of armies, and in the matter of warfare, in drawing up in the army in battle, and hardening the soldiers in battle, she behaved as if she had been the shrewdest captain in the world, and had all her life been learning war. Right, okay, so she was only 14 years old when all this was happening? Give or take, yeah. yeah. Yep. She was about 17 to 19 when she died. So the whole course of her life basically is from 13 to 19. That's wild. I mean, the course of all these major events. Mm-hmm. So, mm. so let's just catalog some pretty supernatural and pretty definitely supernatural feats that Joan achieved before even making it to Orléans. Let's start with the pretty supernatural. Getting Baudricourt and the clergy at Vaucalor, Chinon, and Poitiers to sign off on her voices. So she went to all these learned clergyman said i'm hearing voices and they are saints and angels and they said not necessarily cool but you know neat but valid yeah we'll we'll take it i don't even know if valid just not oh. the devil well that's better than wow so which is still something to say pretty <laughs> supernatural yeah that's that's pretty supernatural um it could be explained by luck or charisma but it's it's a pretty strong streak of of good good luck she also was able to point the king out of the crowd you know it's pretty cool Maybe he wasn't wearing his fanciest yeah. pants that day. I mean, and also <laughs> convince the king. That she's the real deal. And be like, yes, let me lead your army. Historically, <laughs> Charles probably wasn't the smartest or the bravest man. I would so he, that way. He's not big on risk taking, <laughs> uh, but he is big on people telling him he's king. So, you know, could, yeah. could be her charisma. How old was he? Charles? Uh, I don't know. That's I mean, a good if question. If he was like around her age, it might have. Well, I mean, he's a, he's he's a bit older. Yeah, younger. he was a bit older. Yeah, yeah. he's a bit older. Not not in his fifties or anything. All right, so now let's get to the pretty definitely supernatural. Giving Charles a secret sign, and Riley's got some ideas that may have been about his birth. We can't go any further into that. Uh, she knew the location of the sword, which you know there's some possible explanations for, but still, it was miles and miles away from her home, uh, and nobody else seemed to know that the sword was there. Uh, And she possessed knowledge of warfare and battle that impressed military men, despite the fact that she grew up a country girl tending cows with absolutely no exposure to battle or war at all. And even in the medieval period, like, that's like a hardcore thing that you'd spent some time figuring out. Could she read and write? No. No. Then she had this knowledge. She Mm -hmm. just knew how to be in a battle. Wow. Hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And she slept with a bunch of horny French soldiers without being sexually harassed. That's, That's an amazing... That, that is... is the most supernatural yeah. part of all of this. <laughs> all right, let's get on to the siege at Orléans. On October the 24th, under the command of the formidable Earl of Salisbury, inventor of steak, the English <laughs> took command... That's the second... That's not a true fact. The English, <laughs> took com- the English took command of the bridge connecting Orléans to the rest of Charles' loyal France. So cut Orléans off from all of its French allies. Uh, But on that same day, the Earl of Salisbury was struck uh, by a cannonball. Tough luck, man. Yeah, he was standing in the window of the Torel fortification overlooking the territory he'd just taken. The cannon (laughs) shot uh, beat it. (laughs) I'm just picturing some guy like, yes, this is mine. Like, that's the, like, most movie moment I've ever seen. Like, I'm picturing, like, one knee propped up. Gazing out a window Ooh. as a yeah. can. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> so um, it beat in one half of his cheek, Riley, oh. and put out oh, his I thought eye. It was like a big cannonball. Uh, so. And and so died. <laughs> it's a huge. Is that even a, is that considered? Well, I don't a know cannonball? if he was necessarily even hit with a cannonball. It may have just been the you know oh, crumbling oh, stones debris. around him. That's yeah. less fun. Um, so uh, that was how the most feared commander of the English forces met his end. To Riley's glee. (laughs) She's the Catholic. I just want to remind everyone. So the English uh, William de la Pole, Earl of Suffolk, took over to face off against the French Jean Comte de Dunois, the Bastard of Orléans, which is clearly the the coolest title. Mm, Is that what that meant? Comte? No, Comte de de Dunois. uh, Count Count of Dunois, Bastard of Orléans. That's kind of badass. Dang. On May 4th, she had no official role, uh, but she entered the fray of the Battle of Orléans to rally the troops. She was so effective that on May 6th, she was given an official place in the battle. The French pushed the English out of a fortified monastery, but they maintained control of the Orléans Bridge. 
Joan pushed to renew the attack, and there was a night battle on May the 7th in which the French brought a fire ship into the conflict which is just as cool as it sounds. Uh, a fire ship uh, was a wooden vessel filled with combustibles, a.k.a., you know, like dynamite-esque stuff, although dynamite hadn't been invented. Uh, and it was steered or set to just drift into the midst of the enemy and then blow up. The use of the fire ship goes all the way back to the Greeks, and the Chinese used them as well. So they drove the English off the bridge with their fire ship, which essentially broke the whole siege. And on May 8, the English challenged the French to a battle, and the French said, no thanks, we're good now. And so the English marched off. That's me when so... it comes to any conflict. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. People we're... are always challenging you to things, and you're just marching off. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But her role in keeping the French engaged in the battle was so significant that they gave the credit for the win at Orléans to Joan. So was her role, her actual role, literally more like a mascot? Not entirely, because no. she was literally in, in in the midst of things. She was she shot. She was shot with an arrow right in her neck and yeah. was like, going to keep fighting. She did. did wow. she, was she, she actually received several wounds. Of men? Her, she, oh, yeah. yeah, her banner was up like any of the others she of the led, captains. She was a captain she, of the oh, army. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. When I saw Wonder Woman, like the new movie, the scene, like when she's like, no, we're going to go mm -hmm. and like moves the army along after months of them being there. Like, and all these men just follow her. Like my mind went to Joan of Arc. So after Joan broke the siege, uh, Charles was coronated at Rem on July 17. This is all Joan's idea. Some people in the King's Council wanted to press their advantage and continue to attack the British-occupied Normandy, but Joan insisted. French kings were coronated at Rem, and the victory at Orléans gave them the opportunity to make the prince officially king of France by moving the army to Rem to sanctify him. Rem had sort of been cut off from um, Ch Charles' loyal France by this whole conflict with the Burgundians, and now they had access to get there. And Joan said, this is the thing we absolutely have to do. This is the most important thing we could do, is get Charles formally coronated king. Coronation was a kind of irrevocable blessing and an acknowledgement of your power. Uh, so Joan won this argument because her voices had pressed it from the very beginning, which gives a sense of just how much weight Joan and her voices threw around after the win at Orléans, because the voices had predicted that they would win. And she managed to not die and to play a significant role. So her voices are seeming like we should probably listen up. Her parents, two poor farmers from Dom Remy, actually attended the coronation, if you can imagine that, right? Mm -hmm. All of the richest, fanciest people in medieval France, and then these two farmers. There's Joe's, Joan's parents. There they are. Yeah. Yep. Just, Just with, like, signs, like, <laughs> yeah. go, Joan! Yeah, in their good They're actually made aprons. nobles. Joan's Farmer. banner was carried highest mm -hmm. at the event, and one chronicler reported Joan embracing the king's knees at the coronation in joy, telling him he was the true king to whom France should belong. The king then started to make a bunch of terrible decisions. Uh -oh. he, As they do. Yeah, yeah. As soon as he got to be king, started to go downhill. He struck a two-week truce with the English and the Burgundians on the premise that they would hand Paris over to him. But mm. instead, they moved their army in to defend <laughs> Paris oh. while he gave him that time off. Uh, and by negotiating with the English, the king and his weakness pretty much betrayed the whole initiative achieved by Joan and the French army. So, oh, no. Right, because they were going strong. Everyone was feeling yeah. great. They were winning battles. And then he was like, oh, let's take a couple weeks off. You guys will give me Paris, right, if I do that? And they're like, yeah, no. So he won nothing. He Terrible negotiator. Terrible king. Then things started to go downhill for Joan herself, in no small part because she had become a political figure for the French and began following the commands of French leaders like uh, La Tremouille rather than her voices. She made an attempt to take Paris back from the Burgundians, which failed. Her voices had not told her to try to take Paris. After that, she was sent to break a siege, more or less to keep her busy, and that also failed. And her final failure was at Compagnie, a town under threat from Burgundy and the British army, but not before she performed one more miracle. 
On the road to Compagnie at Lagny, Joan came across a baby who had died before it could be baptized, which, according to Catholic dogma at the time, Riley, Thank you. committed the baby <laughs> to purgatory at best. Catholics get um, a lot of flack for this all the way up into the 20th century, mm-hmm. um, the condemnation of unbaptized babies to hell. They, like, try to fix it somewhere in there, and then they're like, no, yeah. let's just go it's back. Like, yeah. <laughs> so Joan no. went with the baby and the ladies of the town to Our Lady of Longy to pray. At last life appeared in this child who yawned three times and was immediately baptized. It died thereafter and was buried in holy ground. Three days had passed, so they said, during which no life had appeared in this child. It was black as my coat, but when it yawned, color began returning to it. I was with the maidens praying on our knees before Our Lady. Back to Joan on the battlefield. Uh, Joan was in the vanguard of the army at Compagnie, and the Burgundians were getting the better of her. The army retreated back into the town, but as Joan attempted to follow them, the Burgundians remained close on her, and the town closed its gates to keep them out, trapping Joan and her men on the wrong side of the drawbridge. And an archer threw Joan down from her horse, and a man-at-arms called the Bastard of Wandome pressed under until... She surrendered herself to him. Pressed under? Hmm. What do you mean by that? I have no idea. Like, like, what I'm picturing is him, like, honestly, like, just stepping on her and being like, submit. <laughs> like, <laughs> stop. No, I saw yeah, him I think that sounds her about down. right. Yeah. yeah, I think you, you got it. Mm-hmm. Oh. Wow. There's a lot of bastards running yeah, around. Yeah, there are. I thought that name With was fancy special. fancy titles. Yeah, yeah. yeah that is a fancy special. title, to be bastard. The Duke of Burgundy then gave her over to an inquisition. Ah, the inquisition. Mm -hmm. It's back again. Always comes back. Uh, The University of Paris brokered Joan's transfer from Burgundy to the English to be tried at Rouen. She was tried by the local bishop, Pierre Cochon, and Jean Le Maistre, the representative of France's Grand Inquisitor, who was at the time too busy to attend this trial, which is bizarre (laughs) because Joan was France's biggest celebrity at this particular moment. What was he too busy doing? It's like being too busy to, I don't know... Go go to the Obama's house when you get an invite? Oh, wait. Yeah, well... Or the the Trumps. Inaugurate. Yep, I didn't really want to use that one. Anyway, like if we had a chance to burn Kim Kardashian. Oh. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, but (laughs) mine was weird. Yeah. Anyway. His political ties uh, were to the English Henrys. Uh, Bishops at the time were princes of the church who had both religious and temporal authority, often owning their own land. It's sort of weird to think about, uh, but that's totally how the medieval world worked. His political ties were to the English uh, Henrys, Pierre Couchon, that is, and he hoped to see Burgundy split off from France. Jean de la Fontaine interrogated Joan, uh, but he also counseled her and was removed from the trial at the end of March probably for being too Joan happy. Mm-hmm. A grand total of 131 assessors served at the trial of Joan of Arc. She was initially given 70 charges, which were reduced to 12. She repudiated her voices and her men's clothing, and she signed an abjuration. So that means she uh, said, no, you know, made it all up. This isn't real. Wait, she ended up selling herself out in the end? No, not in the end, technically, but... You have to remember that before this, she had been through lots of mental and physical torture, had been imprisoned Mm -hmm. for a very long time. They actually shackled her by her neck. And like her, I mean, it was, she'd just been through a lot of, a lot of torture and a lot of interrogation. And so she was so worn out. She also, the day before this, been publicly humiliated. They took her out into the town and everyone publicly humiliated her. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, she did, but oh, well, shortly that, thereafter. Sure, yeah. So she, she abjured, and then she went back on it. Yeah, like she the next said, day she was like, Just yeah. kidding. She A puts on her men's there. clothing again and insists that her voices are real. Also knowing that if she were to reject this uh, retraction, that she wasn't going to get that opportunity again. Yeah, if you recalled your admission you were burned like right away Mm -hmm. there was no second she was completely going to her death so there's a couple of possible explanations for why she went back to male dress uh and and riley sort of um talking around these these grosser issues of her Mm -hmm. imprisonment the first is that her male jailers may have forced her to 
by taking away her female dress and leaving only male clothes for her to wear, sort of forcing the issue of her taking back her confession. The second comes from her last confessor, Martin Ladvenu. He said that the English lords, or, or a particular English lord, uh, had attempted to take Joan by force okay. when she was wearing women's clothing. So she switched back to male dress in order to sort of, um, what am I looking for? Protect Discourage. Yeah. Yeah. That well, was one of the biggest things is that they refused to send her to um, a religious prison, which where she would have had uh, women um, guards, but they kept her at this male prison where they could do whatever. Yeah, they definitely wanted. So not she standard wore practice. Male clothing and armor, understandably. Well, to break her. But yeah. Essentially, the church was doing what the English wanted. The church, like Riley's saying, would have had female guards, but the English were happy to embarrass her any mm-hmm. way that they could. She went through really unspeakable torture. And it's important part, part of why scholars believe that she was actually not a prisoner of the Ingl- Inquisition so much as the English. The English used the church to achieve the verdict of heresy, which they needed to deal a demoralizing blow to the French people who had relied on mm-hmm. Joan as a sort of you know, mascot for France. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she is currently the patron saint of France, FYI, uh, by executing Joan. Once she was labeled a relapsed heretic, the church could hand her over to the English without a second thought, as we were talking about, <laughs> and the return to male dress was all they needed. On the 30th of May, Ladvenu heard her confession and gave her communion. As they lit the fire in the village square, she began repeating the name of Jesus over and over again. She also said, one of her last words, they, she asked someone to hold the cross. So her last words were, hold the cross high so that I can see it through the flames. So Oof. they said, hold it high as she burned. That's actually, that's really cool. That's kind of that metal. was like her last, <laughs> like she was like, hold it high and like just repeated the name of Jesus. After she had screamed out the Lord's name one final excruciating time, the English cleared back the fire to show the weeping crowd that she was really dead because they were worried uh, that people would think she had somehow escaped Mm -hmm. even in the midst of the flames, that she could somehow get out. After all, she was talking to angels. Um, So they wanted to show her, look, she's gone. Or rather, you can see her body disintegrating. Your martyr is gone. Many French outside of Rouen actually refused to believe she was dead, thinking it was just English war propaganda. And a series of women claimed to be Joan, beginning as early as the last few months of her life while she was still in prison, and going on for more than a decade later, like Elvis. Oh, no. Or even like Hitler. People claim to see Hitler in South America. Yeah. This frequently happens with very famous people who die tragically, that we refuse to believe they're gone. Yeah, like people still like swear by the Elvis thing, and I'm yeah. like, bewildered by that. <laughs> He's even he would be old now, right? We don't want any negative comments about our Elvis disbelief. By 1435, the alliance between England and Burgundy fell apart, and the next year Paris was recaptured by the French. Rouen fell in 1449, and by 1453, the English had been driven out of France. Charles the Seventh never spoke about Joan again after her death. Not the bravest of men. This, wait, the one that she made king. He yes. abandoned her. Right. Wow. Well, he, yeah, he, yeah. Are you surprised? And, I guess I'm not. <laughs> but the, the nicest thing he did was launch an inquest into her trial in about 1450, but, but the inquest fell apart. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean, inquest? So basically asking whether or not the trial was legitimate. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and and she, it wasn't. It was a political trial. No. Yeah. So uh, Joan was canonized a saint in 1920, and yeah. So that's our...